Good afternoon. Uh, the paper I present today is the co-work of me and my colleague, Dr. Seok Yoon Har, and it is titled uh, Procyclicality of Bank Loans Under Information Asymmetry. I will first introduce you the motivations behind the paper and brief survey of the relevant literature, but then again, Alicia gave so detailed uh, review, so I'll just skip that part. And then I will demonstrate the core model developed in the paper, and I will move on to its policy implications in terms of capital regulations. I will wrap it up with extensions done and can be done, and concluding remarks. Well, uh, the current crisis clearly demonstrated how information asymmetry can easily lead to market failures. Now, everybody clearly agrees on the need for proper regulations on financial systems, but then again, maybe not on the exact content of the regulations. Well, therefore, this paper attempts to explore just a simple small part of the question by examining the procyclicality of bank loan provision in presence of information asymmetry between a bank and investors. Well, those investors are the ones who have intention of holding bond, including the deposit, sorry, or the equities issued by the bank. Uh, we examine how the existing equity holders of a bank exploit their informational superiority over the potential bond and equity buyers. We also analyze how this behavior influences the lending and funding decisions of the bank. Then the paper moves on to the financial regulator's problem and attempts to address what type of capital requirement will enhance market efficiency. In addition, it extends the setup to allow multiple loan applications and shows why the regulator should be concerned about the portfolio risk of banks, even in a risk-neutral world. Okay. So I'll, uh, yeah, this is something I'll just skip. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we use a very simple model for tractability. I think for many of you, it's just a review of what you are already too familiar with. So the model is based on the classical model by Meyers and Majulov, 1984, and also on this updated version by Yoon and Park, 2009. Therefore, the majority of the notations we adopt is from the work by Yoon and Park. Well, in the simple economy, there are four agents, a bank, all the shareholders, new shareholders and bondholders. The bank receives a loan application randomly drawn and it makes a decision whether to provide one unit of loan to the project. Well, once loan provision is determined, the bank will raise the required fund by issuing bond or new equity. Through the whole process, the bank is assumed to maximize the older shareholders' expected value from the loaning and financing activities. It should be noted that the rate of return from a loan project follows a uniform distribution defined between zero and GT. So GT, the maximum rate of return, follows a stationary AL1 process which mimics a business cycle with persistent parameter lambda. Here what is notable is that there exists information asymmetry between bank and old equity holders versus new bond and equity holders. Well, to be more specific, Regarding the current economic situation, the bank and the old equity holders have more information since they know the exact distribution with the maximum being GT. But the new bond holders and the equity holders or wannabe uh, don't have that information. So therefore, they have to make a rougher conjecture by making an expectation of GT with only past figures. The payoffs to bond and equity holders follow the usual customs. So the bond holders get the predetermined payment and the shareholders being the residual claimant. If the rate of return from the loan project cannot recoup the bond payment, the bondholders will collect whatever is left and the shareholders will go empty-handed. So based on these assumptions, first we solve for the bondholders, no arbitrary condition. Then we calculate the expected value of investment to shareholders from the standpoint of view, uh, standpoint of uh, new equity holders. Well, according to these values, uh, the share of the new equity holders is determined. After plugging all these values into the old shareholders maximization problem, we solve for the DT star, uh, the amount of debt financing, which maximizes the expected return to the old shareholders. 
Well, once again, I have to point out that here the older shareholders or the bank is not investing any of its existing capital for the loan project, just for simplicity. Well, you may easily extend the model so that the bank not only seeks for the financing from outside, but also for chance of internal financing as well. Well, assuming a business cycle which is shaped like GT in the top figure, the proportion of debt financing will take either of the two forms in the bottom figure. I will not go in details on that, but um, yeah. Well, by plugging the explicit closed form solution for the proportion of debt financing into the other equations, well, we can simply drive explicit closed form solution for other key variables such as the expected value return to the old shareholders, which is V star, the bond yield, L T plus one star, and the share of the new equity holders, alpha T. While doing some qualitative analysis with the solutions, we arrive at following two propositions, uh, which in fact can be uh, directly inferred from the solutions themselves. So the proposition one simply states that the old shareholders, or you can say the bank, only approves a project that are expected to add some value to their own existing wealth. And then the second proposition indicates that in this economy, loan provision is not efficient due to information asymmetry, which exists between the investor and the bank. Therefore, the loan cycle seems to have a phase difference with the business cycle. Well, Graphically representing these claims, uh, we see that loan provision is made only during two sub-periods in a business cycle. Well, like I told you, this is uh, based on a very simple, uh, some, uh, simplified model. The left one is the period in which the economy just escapes from a trough. On the other hand, the second one is a period in which the economy has already passed the peak and right before entering into another recession. So these periods share common characteristics in that the old shares can receive more than what they deserve from providing loans in the market due to their information superiority. Well then, upper two curves uh, represents uh, GDP and debt issued by bank, uh, which includes the deposit plus other obligations, except the equity, for over the last decade. The bottom blue line shows you the trend in uh, bank loans. All three variables are in real terms, localized, seasonally adjusted, and detrended by Hodrick Prescott filter. We took these tedious processes uh, mainly because we are interested in observing the movements of key variables in a business cycle. With usual eyeball test, it does not seem clear whether the procyclicality uh, sustains. So we took the issue more formally by running following regressions. So here the dummy variable shows in which state of the cycle we're in. It is one when the value of GDP detrended by the HP filter is positive. In other words, when the economy is in a boom. Otherwise, the dummy will have a zero value. So from the table, we can see that if we look at the whole cycle, debt financing by banks does not show strong pattern of procyclicality. However, if we divide the cycle into uh, boom and recession, shown by the dummy variable, it is now more clear that uh, it's clear that uh, there exists some degree of procyclicality. More specifically, uh, when the economy is in recession cycle, it seems that the debt financing exhibits some pattern of procyclicality in a non-linear fashion. Well, in case of bank loans the procyclicality can be confirmed significantly even over the whole cycle. However, if we divide the cycle into two groups, once again, it becomes more apparent that the procyclicality mainly comes from the boom cycle. The magnitude of the coefficient attached to GDP variable is higher when we only consider the boom period. So this graph shows uh, how the efficiency of loan provision changes along the business cycle. To measure the efficiency, we take uh, two different measures. One is the probability that a loan granted is ex ante efficient. And the other one is the probability that a declined loan application is in fact ex ante efficient. 
So we might reminding that uh, only those dotted lines, uh, dotted circles, represent the periods with the probability of loan provision being positive. I will try to offer a more intuitive interpretation. So let's look at the left circles. Uh, in this recovery period, quality of approved loan pools tend to be improving. Well, in contrast, after the peak of the business cycle, quality of approved loan pools tend to be degrading, I mean, in probabilistical terms. So actually, the first measure is equivalent to one minus uh, ex ante default probability. Uh, there seems to exist a nonlinear relationship between the default probability and the business cycle. Here we took the same procedure on the data of delinquency ratio as we did earlier with the size of loans. The graph shows strong procyclicality of bank loans. Well, here the years 2004 and 5 marks the period right after the credit card boom bust in Korea. Years 2009 and on shows you the impact of current crisis and the following recovery. So here we are reporting regression results again. Based on our conjecture that there seems to exist a nonlinear relationship between the delinquency probability and the business cycle, the results indicate that the square of the real GDP terms as well as the detrended real GDP term shows statistically significant relationship with delinquency ratio. Furthermore, the square term effect significantly differs by having the dummy variable attached to it. We also performed similar tests with dishonored ratio of commercial papers, which has longer time series, and the results derived were qualitatively same with the results you are seeing right now. So far, we haven't yet introduced a regulatory intervention on bank capital structure. Well, this, uh, what you're seeing now, is the maximization problem a bank faces in presence of capital regulation. While this form of restriction can also be understood as putting a ceiling on a bank's leverage ratio. We wanted to examine whether a capital requirement would enhance the market efficiency when there exists information asymmetry. Here we focus only on the state where the capital requirement for bank is binding. Uh, the expected value of a project to the bank can be represented as you see in the slide. The key factor that determines the sign of the bank's expected value will be lambda times g t minus 1 plus 1 minus lambda times g bar being greater than or uh, less than 4 times k star times risk-free rate of return. So the economy is efficient only when this condition on the screen holds. And consider the following form of capital requirement. We can easily check that uh, this regulation passes the efficiency criteria. Uh, in, real, uh, in reality, however, the up-to-date information is usually not available even to the financial regulator. Therefore, KT star is not uh, implementable in that sense. Well, here I'm showing you two graphs, uh, each of which shows the impact of uh, constant capital regulations in two ways. The first graph of loan provision does not look too different from the ones we have already seen without the capital regulations. But the second figure demonstrates some difference from the cases before. The proportion of debt financing is now binded, at least for some values. Well then, I, uh, we played with the magnitude of regulation K, the constant uh, capital requirements then we could identify some cases where the capital regulation can induce differences in, even to the loan provision itself. As you can see in the figures, uh, there may exist an area or even multiple areas in which the loans are no longer provided due to the capital regulations. This time the missing area appears, uh, appears before the peak of the cycle, but we cannot exclude the possibility that it will show up after the peak. As I mentioned before, in reality, up-to-date information is not usually available, even to the financial regulator. And therefore, the first best capital regulation is not implementable. So I suggest two more types of capital regulation. One is countercyclical, in that it is tightened in a boom, while the other one is procyclical, in the sense that it is loosened in a boom. Well, let me skip the example two. So the 
Upper graph represents how the business cycle and the expectation for the business cycle evolves over time in this economy. Based on this graph, we draw the lossy of three different capital requirement rules in the graph below. The black colored, uh, black colored one is the most efficient in that under this rule, the bank is constrained by the requirement to determine its loan provision according to the efficiency criteria. Uh, that's the one we saw at the very beginning. And then here the efficiency criteria is of course the, to check whether the expected rate of return from a loan application is greater than the risk-free rate. But then again the gray colored curve KT triple star stands for procyclical capital requirement which nowadays most economists seem to blame for amplifying the business fluctuations. Excuse me. Uh, and the last green colored one is counter cyclical. Though I do not show here by comparing the performances of the three capital requirement rules, we can arrive at, at an interesting result. Well, depending on the magnitude of business cycle persistency, the procyclical measure actually may outperform the counter cyclical one. It is especially so when the persistence is relatively longer. Well, economic intuition behind this can be found from those figures you're seeing right now. When the business cycle has low frequency, the gap between KT star and KT triple star would narrow down significantly. Well, in contrast, if the business cycle has higher frequency, the gap between KT star and the KT double star, which is the counter-cyclical counter counter uh, regulation, would narrow down. Well, considering that emerging markets tend to have shorter business cycles, the, this result implies that, at least for those uh, developing or countries or the emerging markets, a counter-cyclical capital requirement would be a better fit. Well, uh, I have to make an apology. I mean, the paper distributed, uh, there are some typos regarding the notations, and uh, please just make a note of that. Well, I'll skip the notations and derivation of the extension of multiple loan cases, and we'll go directly to the implications of such a case. I'll skip this as well. Okay. So far, we have discussed only the regulations on the liability side of the bank. If we turn our attention to the case in which multiple loan opportunities are available, then we can see that a separate regulation on the asset side of the bank is also required. This is, well, not exactly the same, but uh, basically consistent with the current approach to the capital adequacy ratio regulation taken by most of the regulatory bodies. Well, so I'll just conclude the paper. I still have uh, two minutes or so, okay. This paper is an attempt to demonstrate following facts. Uh, how bank lending and financing decision could be distorted in presence of information asymmetry based on a toy model. And we found that resource allocation in an economy with no capital requirement is inefficient. And then whether and how capital regulation alleviates the efficiency loss from this distortion. So for this, uh, several rules of capital requirements are compared for their relative performance in raising the probabilities of providing or declining loans according to their precise expected profit profitability. Well, in addition, we also discussed uh, why a financial regulator should be concerned about the loan portfolio risks of the bank and levy a constraint on the loan portfolio, even in an economy full of risk-neutral agents. Uh, okay. The current setup could also be perceived as a case of uh, information asymmetry exists between the borrower and the banks. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, in the, in the model uh, of the paper, well, the, we only looked at the information asymmetry between the bank and the p potential investors into the bank, but we also can easily transfer the model into the problem of information asymmetry between uh, the borrower and the banks. So well, we may be able to apply it to the like, mortgage markets as well. Well, of course, uh, for the 
policy analysis would suggest that uh, capital requirements for borrowers, uh, for example, like LTB, which uh, a lot of people have talked about, referred to, could be effective as the capital requirement of the banks in the original case. Okay. So, uh, okay. so that's all I got today. All right. Thank you very much.